how best to respond, you know, on site and through distributions. So uh, yes, yeah, social distancing within our facilities, you know, t in normal times, uh, volunteers work elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder in handling food and getting food out. So that had to change. And then we had to really change distributions, these drive-through distributions uh, are new uh, from the pandemic response. Uh, people are surprised to see fresh produce and dairy and perishable and frozen items at distribution. They're thinking, oh, food bank, probably some kind of old canned food. And you know that, that's probably where food banks were many, many years ago. Uh, but we have really transformed and want to access as much of a variety and nutritious content of food and get that out. You know, I, I think the as we look into 2021, um, I think we're all hoping with the, the vaccine being deployed, and I think we all hope to see the you know the economy bounce back very strong, um, and, and unemployment decrease, and, and you know people working again. Um, but it does unfortunately seem like you know this is going to be a long run situation for many families and individuals. We're doing what we can to gear up for 2021 to keep, uh, to keep doing what we're doing. For many of us, looking back on 2020 is a cringe-worthy experience. But believe it or not, a few pretty cool things did happen in Los Angeles last year. Council members Curran Price of District 9 and Mitch O'Farrell of District 13 each reflected on their achievements of 2020 and their aspirations for 2021. Maria Hall Brown reports. Council member Price, it's so nice to see you. Good seeing you, Maria. It's good to be with you and, and your viewers. You made some pretty strong decisions with the new night during this past year, in particular around COVID and testing and making sure that there was an outreach to the people that you serve. What did you realize and why did you make the decisions and what exactly did you do? Well, you know, it was apparent early on that uh, minority communities were being disproportionately impacted uh, with this uh, pandemic. So it was imperative for us as a government, local government, to help get the word out, to spread the word. You bet. And you stepped in also with testing. How were your testing programs? Well, we're really excited about that. We probably tested over 100,000 over the past uh, several months. Uh, we established uh, the first uh, walk-up uh, testing facility. We're doing testing in the senior centers, senior homes uh, with our fire department. Uh, we even uh, uh, have uh, reached out to, to organizations. So we're getting the word out, we're providing services. Well, Tennyson said, hope smiles for the threshold of the year to come, whispering it will be happier. Council Member Price, do you think it's gonna be happier? What are you looking forward to? Well, I do think it's going to be happier. I think, uh, you know, we should all be uh, excited about the vaccine. Uh, in the meantime, we have to do what we need to do, and that is still be mindful, uh, be careful, uh, and uh, kind of watch the science. But as we do roll back out, we're excited about supporting our local businesses, our small businesses, helping them to uh, continue to be uh, employers uh, in, in our community. Uh, we know we've got to provide uh, assistance uh, for renters, uh, for small uh, property owners uh, and, and we've got to do more making sure that we're leveraging resources for our youth especially inner city youth black and brown youth are falling behind on, on the learning curve uh, with the uh, either not having access to technology not not utilizing it uh, the ineffectiveness of, of the systems so we got to do a better job uh, almost uh, uh, a third of my population is under 18. Uh, Maria, so I'm sensitive, real sensitive to the needs that we have, and so we're always expanding opportunities in our parks, recreation centers, open spaces. Uh, again, trying to be a bridge uh, with as the school with the schools as they continue to educate our kids. Well, I look forward to talking to you in the new year. I appreciate you being with us today, and warmest wishes for the holiday, sir. Thank you. Same to you and your family. I am delighted to be joined by Council Member Mitch O'Farrell from the 13th. So nice to see you, Mitch. There's a joke. You too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was a quote I had to actually say, think about this, by a man named Henry Guest. He said, if plan A fails, remember you still have 25 letters. I think that is a perfect explanation of all the decisions that had to be made in such a tumultuous year. And you made some really, really positive choices. 
Uh, how do you feel as the year ends here? Well, Maria, first of all, thank you for having me. It's great to see you. And I think that if we go with that example, we're probably on X, Y, and Z. <laughs> yes. Let me just let me just do it. Say a disclaimer here. Nothing we ever do is enough or will be enough, uh, considering the challenges we face. But my team and I set to make sure that we did everything we could to keep people fed and housed. The funding that I did for the renters helped about 500 households in the 13th wow. district. We turned that into a citywide program where we used CARES Act funding. We allocated over $100 million to help renters across the city. We know that over 50,000 households in the city of LA have benefited from this. Wow. And, and so many of the things that you're talking about are so fundamental to people's uh, basic needs, and including being fed. Yes, so uh, I, I worked with my colleague Paul Krikorian on a state-funded program for delivering meals to seniors. Uh, and we, we did that while also supporting taxi cab drivers. Yeah. Uh, so we supported the taxi cab industry while, while delivering meals to seniors. So that's one thing that we did months ago. Uh, but as far as the food distribution, yeah, I mean, back in the first week of April, I was at the Dream Center in my district helping them distribute drive-through uh, food distribution efforts, which they've continued. And since then, I've worked with about 20 organizations, uh, just so many. And then we began doing a monthly food distribution in addition to all that out of my field office. And we're gonna continue that once a month through all of 2021, because it's gonna take a while to get caught up even once the vaccines uh, have been rolled out and, and the pandemic begins to ease. It's gonna take a lot of work and recovery after that. But now there's a new year ahead of us. And so what are you looking forward to in 2021? Once the pandemic eases, there's gonna be such pent up energy to just get back out there once we are, are back out there enjoying life, we're gonna value things much more. And I, I hope that we never ever forget that. There will probably be the 2020 pandemic generation. And, and um, you know, it's a reminder of how precious life is and how uh, appreciative we can be for the blessings that we have. Well, thank you for all you've done. And I look forward to seeing you in person and warmest wishes for the new year. In our feature story this week, we meet the general manager of one of LA's most beloved national historical landmarks. Our own Rasha Goel sits down with Joe Furin to get the latest on what is happening at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. It's known as the greatest stadium in the world and has been host to many historical events. But it's more than just a sports place, the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. And to tell us more about it is general manager Joe Furin. Well, it's uh, almost 100 years old. We're 97 years old, so we have a centennial celebration. And that's 10 decades of unbelievable things. As you said, not just the sports, but the, Olymp the Olympics start everything off. That's our bookends from 1932 to 1984. But beyond that, being a uh, place for concerts, being uh, motor shows, automotive shows, pop culture, Evil Knievel jumped in the LA Coliseum. So you're talking uh, religious events, political rallies, uh, community events, fireworks shows, military celebrations, the list is endless. Um, you know, what's also so interesting is that USC spearheaded this big renovation project in 2018. So you guys were ready to go by the 2019 football season, $315 million project. The stadium unfortunately had fallen into neglect and needed a lot of upgrades. And so that is why USC decided uh, we'll, we'll continue to play there. We'll make that commitment. We'll be there for the next 100 years, but in exchange, and, and we'll put the money in, but in exchange, we want to manage the place. So yes, it was a 300 plus million dollar project, uh, very exciting for us. You know, something we didn't talk about also is how it's a living memorial. Yes. So tell our um, audience about that a little for those who are unfamiliar. Yeah, it, we are a memorial to the World War I Armed Forces, uh, the U.S. Armed Forces, anyone who served. Uh, back in the 20s, uh, coming off the heels of uh, the end of World War I, nationwide there was a, a push, uh, a, a large publicity movement to honor uh, those that had served uh, in the war. 
and and uh, so the community leaders wanted to build a memorial to the call to the excuse me to the veterans. At about the same time, the Coliseum project was was uh, uh, coming together, and so it was a natural fit to name it the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. It has been such a pleasure, General Manager Joe Furin, having you here with us to share these nuggets about this historical venue, the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. Uh, we'll definitely be looking out for more exciting events when we are able to return back to the stadium. You can watch Joe Furin's full interview with Rasha Goel by visiting our YouTube channel, LA City View 35. Check out Black Motion Pictures on redcat.org, donate to a human trafficking awareness drive, or explore bringing the zoo to you online. All this up next on Virtual Things to Do. Join feminist performance artist Gabrielle Civil for Black Motion Pictures, a series of Zoom interviews with radical black creatives about race, performance, and representation. Enjoy talks with interdisciplinary artist and dancer Anna Martine Whitehead, actress filmmaker Sola Bamis, and interdisciplinary designer Kelly Walters. Don't miss Black Motion Pictures, a virtual event happening now through January 14th. To view this video series, visit redcat.org. Join Council President Nuri Martinez as she kicks off Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Every year, the Council President spearheads a month-long toiletry drive to benefit victims and survivors of human trafficking. Everything is needed from toothbrushes to shampoo to deodorant. There are three locations where you can donate all month long. Recognize Human Trafficking Awareness Month with a full-size donation. For information, call 213-473-7006. The LA Zoo may be closed for in-person visits, but dedicated animal keepers have dreamed up the next best thing. Bringing the Zoo to You video series gives its online audience incredible views and some new perspectives on our animal residents and the compassionate experts who care for them. See how the LA Zoo delivers meaningful opportunities for discovery, education, and inspiration every day online. The Bringing the Zoo to You video series is available for viewing free right now. Visit lazoo.org slash zoo to you. And that's a look at some virtual things to do. That's it for this edition. I'm Natalia Bilbao. From all of us here at LA This Week, thank you so much for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. See you next time for more LA This Week.
Okay, good morning and welcome to the Los Angeles City Council. Today is Wednesday, January 13th. I'm Nuri Martinez, the president of the City Council. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Blumenfield. Bonin. Bonin present. Buscaino. Here. Cedillo. Cedillo. De Leon. Here. Harris Dawson. Here. Correct. Present. Krikorian. Lee. Present. Martinez. Present. O'Farrell. Present. Price. Raman. Here. Ridley Thomas. Here. Rodriguez. Here. 11 members present and a quorum, Madam President. Okay, first order of business. Approval of the minutes of Tuesday, January 12, 2021. Ms. Mr. O'Farrell moves and Mr. Corrett seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Mr. Ridley Thomas moves and Ms. Roman seconds. Next. Madam President, would council like all items to go forth with today? Without objection, that will be the order. Madam President, there is a request to refer item four back to the Planning and Land Use Management Committee. Okay, without objection, that will be the order. Items one through 18 are items for which public hearings have been held. Items 19 through 21 are items for which public hearings have not been held. 10 votes are required for consideration. Okay, members, those items are not before us. Does anyone wish to call any of these items special? Okay, I see no specials today. Oh, Mr. Mr. Bonin, please. Uh, press yeah, your virtual... uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I wanted to call uh, item 18 special uh, for discussion and uh, for the purposes of a uh, potential uh, amendment. Uh, I'm sort of spitballing it now, but I'll read it in so it can be done before public comment. Uh, and that would be to amend to add an additional instruction to. Uh, request the city attorney to draft an ordinance that would provide fines and penalties for refusal to wear a mask at an indoor public facility when requested to do so by management or operators of a facility or establishment or their agents and to provide fines and penalties for refusing to wear a mask uh, while invading someone's personal space. Is there a second? A second by Mr. Koretz. Uh, Mr. Bonin, can you please circulate that as soon as possible? You bet. Thank you. Th thank you. Uh, Mr. Koretz? Yes, I'd like to also uh, add an amendment to uh, item 18 and to speak to it. Um, and the amendment would read, I move that the matter of the health, education, neighborhoods, parks, arts, and river committee report relative to the COVID-19 guidelines for wearing masks in public enforcement and the safety and efficacy of masks Item number 18 on today's agenda, CF 20-0429, be amended to additionally instruct all departments with administrative uh, citation enforcement ACE program authority to prioritize the issuance of citations during the normal course of business to persons not wearing a mask in public and report in 30 days with a status update on the issuance of citations including numbers of citations issued, rates of compliance, and any ongoing challenges. And uh, I believe that's uh, to be seconded by Mr. Blumenfield. Mr. Blumenfield, can you confirm that, sir? And okay, Mr. Mr. Blumenfield is. is not here, so can you get another second? Yes, I'd be happy to take another second. Anyone second. wish to second Mr. Coretz's amending motion? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. Mr. Coretz, I believe you've already sent your amending motion. Is that correct to the city clerk? I believe that is correct. All right, thank you. Members, are there any other specials? Okay, Madam Clerk, can we what items can we go ahead and vote on? We can go ahead and vote on items one through three and five through 17. Okay, let's go ahead and prepare to vote on those items. Please call the roll. Blumenfield. Bonin. Bonin, aye. 
Buscaino. Yes. Cedillo. Aye. De Leon. Aye. Harris Dawson. Yes. Caretz. Aye. Krikorian. Aye. Lee. Aye. Martinez. Aye. O'Farrell. Aye. Price. Aye. Raman. Aye. Ridley Thomas. Aye. Rodriguez. Aye. 14 ayes. These items are adopted. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to public comment. Go ahead and read out the information, call in information followed by the city attorney. Thank you. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comment should call 669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-535-8466 and then press pound. Then press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Let me repeat. Call 669-254-5252. 5252 and use meeting ID number 160-535-8466 and then press pound. Then press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. To members of the public calling in, when it's your turn to speak, please state which of the agenda items you'd like to speak on. You have one minute per item to speak, up to three minutes total, and if you wish, one minute for general public comment. Please speak on the items first before providing general public comment. We'll tell you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you're not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you're speaking on topic, you'll get one brief warning from me or the president. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic or again stray off topic, the president will cut you off and you'll forfeit the rest of your speaking time and we'll move on to the next speaker. We'll take 30 minutes total of public comment. The items that are open for public comment are items 18 through 21. Finally, for members of the public calling in to speak, as soon as you hear someone, read out the last four digits of your phone number or if you're calling in with a block number, other identifying information. You're live in the council meeting and it's your turn to speak. Please press star six to unmute yourself. We understand that you may be listening to the meeting on a computer or other device. Please keep one ear on the phone because there's a time delay between the live meeting and the broadcast, and when it's your turn to speak, we want to know that you're there. So please press star six right away, and then turn down the volume on the other devices immediately so we avoid feedback and confusion because of the time delay. Thank you, Madam President. We're ready to take public comment. Please go ahead and take the first caller. Um, do me a favor, Mr. City Attorney, repeat the items that we can go ahead and take public comment on. Sure, 18 through 21. Thank you. Go ahead and take the first caller. Caller with the phone number ending in 3843, please press star six. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Andrea Jimenez, general public comment, um, eviction moratorium. Okay, you have one minute, go ahead. I decided to speak before you as the last attempt to save my family. The eviction moratorium will be the death of us. It has resulted in a disabled veteran with PTSD and his family to be homeless risking our safety and unable to live in our own home during a pandemic. Due to all of this, my husband has had multiple suicidal crises from the stress brought upon the multiple extensions of the eviction moratorium. I do not think it is fair that my toddler, my husband, and I should be forced to be homeless because we're not allowed to evict for landlord occupancy, even though we're just regular homeowners. If the first eviction moratorium extension never would have happened and no false evictions would have been allowed, the tenants would be living safely in their own permanent residence and we would be living in our own home. All we ask is that no false evictions be allowed in order to get the opportunity to live in our own home and be safe. I have reached out to not only Councilman Cedillos and Le Leon's office, as well as other representatives and departments of the city of LA and have had zero success, always being told there's nothing that can be done for me or others thank like you, me. Thank you. I hope. Caller with the phone number ending in 6068, please press star six. 
Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, yes, this is Richie Serjanko from People City Council in Sunrise in LA. I'd like to speak about 18, 19, 20 in general public comment, please. Do you have three minutes for the items and one minute for your general public comment? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, item 18, um, <clears throat> talking about maskless individuals and, and the liability about entering uh, someone else's space um, during this time of COVID. Um, I'm, and, you know, I want to link this to the statements made by some of the council members <clears throat> about the insurrection, uh, insurrectionists in D.C. the other day. Um, there was no, no statement made by any council members about the vicious attack by white supremacists in front of City Hall on, on a black woman the other day. And I make that point because <clears throat> LAPD Captain Richard Paul Stable was there and he's on video, um, you know, yeah showing that he doesn't care about pursuing so, speaker, uh, speaker, the attack. Sorry to cut you off, Speaker. Uh, which agenda say, item are you on, or have you gone me. straight to general public comment? Oh, I was I was just going to make a point about uh, how there were LAPD officers unmasked. I, I understand unmasked, that. So uh, do you want to speak to the agenda uh, items, or do you want to go straight to general public comment? Okay, I'll speak on nine, 19 and 20. Um, I, I wonder how that, um, you know, number 19, uh, got on the agenda. Um, I saw that it skipped through the Energy, Climate Change, and Environmental Justice Committee. And, um, you know, this, this looks like it could be a totally innocuous agreement, but also from the city attorney's office, it comes from David Michelson. And do we know if David Michelson has any connections to Sunstreams for LLC or the switchyard? You know, I, it, it could have been a totally reasonable agreement. Um, but we're not entirely sure why and why we skip through, you know, the council usually doesn't doesn't skip a committee unless it's something important or if someone has financial interest. And that's kind of linked to, to number 20, you know, about the the city's billing scandal that the city attorney, Mike Spear, said that he was going to handle. And it turned into, uh, you know, costing the city a bunch of money. And the FBI raided the city attorney and the DWP in 2019 over it. So the connection of 19 and 20, you know, how 19 skips committee agenda and ends up on the agenda, and then 20 about how Mike Beer, you know, uh, said that this settlement uh, was going to be good for the city, and it was handled corruptly, and the FBI ended up raiding city, the city attorney and DWP. And it's funny that the, the FBI has such a connection uh, to elected officials in Los Angeles, like John Lee. Um, I wonder how many, and this can go for uh, general public comment now, Strepin, so you don't cut me off. John Lee, uh, I can't wait to see the day you are arrested and in handcuffs. I wonder if there are any council members that are willing to stand up uh, and say anything about John Lee's corruption and investigation by the FBI. John Lee, I see you. Look into the screen. Why are you looking down right now, you coward? I can't wait to see the FBI fucking drag you out in handcuffs. This is for you, Joey Buckets. We don't call you Joey Buckets because of basketball. We call you Joey Buckets because you're obsessed with human species and you're a piece of shit. You're not a fucking good person, Joe Buscaino. Stop assuming that you are. You're sweeping unhoused residents in the middle of a pandemic against CDC violations. Your office keeps trying to sell it as something else and you're lying and you're gaslighting Angelino. We know you're full of shit, Buckets. Shout out Mike Bonham for standing up to the LAPPL, something that a lot of your colleagues don't have the, uh, the, the gall to do. John Lee and Joey Buckets, big fans of the cops, happen to be the two shittiest fucking council members, pieces of shit. Your next speaker. Caller with the phone number ending in 7719, please press star six. Caller, with the, please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Thank you. It's, it's Eric Previn, and I'm going to speak on the, the four items, and I'll give a little general public comment as well. Okay, Mr. Previn, you've got three minutes for your items and one minute for general public comment. Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. You know, I understand, and I agree that people, item 18, should be wearing masks when they're having contact with other individuals. I'm just not sure that citing and penalizing at this stage of the game is going to 
make a material difference. It's only outlying um, uncivic, uncooperative people who are flagrantly violating. And the people who are walking in the streets, you know, we just don't have the manpower, so whatever. It does not excite me. Um, and I'll tell you, meter reading is something that LADWP, you've got several of those items there today, uh, doesn't really involve human contact. And yet during the period uh, between, you know, this COVID beginning and more recently, people got huge bills because they weren't able to claim to read the meters properly. So that during the, hot, the very hot months when air conditioning was necessary, you know, a, a guy who pays three, four hundred dollars every couple months was paying sixteen hundred in the holiday time. So it was heartbreaking. And it all came down to customer support by LADWP, which is interesting because item 20 is a, a, a renewal of a contract where I look for the procurement summary and apparently Krikorian and Avoc feel that's not applicable. We don't need to know how it was procured, but they're increasing it by 40 million to $116 million for customer support help. And the people who are getting the money is Oracle, which I don't need to remind you is Larry Ellison, who uh, you'll probably remember purchased a great swath of Los Angeles along the coast, Malibu, and probably moved to Hawaii. So it's a big finger. And this is a guy who pretty much, he's built a business out of locking people into his stuff and lawsuits against his own customers. I mean, he's a really antisocial character. And here we are ingratiating him during a pandemic you know, and, you know, enriching him, it is appalling. And at the very center of it is Michael Fuhr and Jim Clark and Leela Kapoor slinking around in the office of city attorney, uh, trying to get out of very wrongdoing behavior in their office that they knew about with the Price Water Cooper House. I, you know, dragged it to the federal authorities. Everybody, there's a big lawsuit, class action, and this money, part of the 40 million up, is to handle this during these pending litigation, which I can see little steam coming out of Buscaino's ears if you look closely. And Krikorian is going, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. This is a fantastic deal. It is not a fantastic deal. We are doing a terrible job of managing our uh, up and up behavior. It was so appalling what Paradis and those lawyers did and do. I, I could, uh, as we get to my general public comment, I'll just give you a brief story about the historic lawsuit that I won you know, against you guys for the special meetings, with that you have to take comments on agendized items. Well, the end of that, the city attorney <laughs> tried to get to my lawyer and did, and my lawyer signed something that I absolutely never saw, never agreed to. His name is Paul Nicholas Boylan, for the record. But the city attorney was the one who was doing something that is just out of bounds. It's completely out of bounds. And, you know, I bring these things to your attention as the public out there listening, because I think that we need to do a better job. We can't keep reelecting these same uh, crooked guys. You know, Mike Pure is not going to be mayor. OK, now, let's start there. And Koretz, who wants to cite people for wearing a mask, should not be the controller if the controller can't respond to CPRA requests in a timely manner. He wants to embrace, uh, you know, Ron Galper that way. Anyway. It looks like my time is up, and I'm sure everybody is ready to move on, except for Mr. Harris Dawson, who wants more. And uh, thank you. Next speaker. Call in user one. Please state. Please press star six. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Yeah, this is Damon. I'd like to speak on all agenda items and general public comment, please. So you can speak. You have three minutes for items 18 through 21, followed by one minute for general public comment. Okay. Uh, first, let me talk about 18 then. Um, <laughs> we've seen ample evidence uh, over the past uh, week or so that law enforcement does not equally enforce laws against white supremacists who are the ones running around with, without the masks. Uh, this was seen in front of the city council the other day uh, when the LAPD just ignored hate crimes right in front of them. So who do we think is gonna get targeted with this anti-mask violation penalty? It's not gonna be the white supremacists running around targets uh, viewing and spitting in everyone's faces 
we've already seen LAPD does not take any action on them in the malls, in Target at all. We know who this is going to be used against, black and brown people. This is garbage. It, it, it's a pathetic attempt, and, and, and there's no way to enforce this, and it will be enforced totally unevenly. Uh, 19 and 20, um, <laughs> the L.A. City Council has John Lee on it right now, a guy who is completely corrupt, and you guys are waving things through committee. The general public has no confidence in you, none whatsoever, that this is, this, items like these are not being waved through in a corrupt manner. And that's, that's what happens when you allow someone like John Lee to remain on the city council. We have no trust in you. The public has absolutely no trust in you to be acting in our best interest and not be making corrupt deals. We don't know what this is about. You guys obviously wanted to limit public comment on it, so you waved it through this committee. Who is this financially benefiting? That's what I'd like to know, and I'm sure there's lots of people on this call who'd like to know this also. Now I'll move on to general public comment. Uh, I want to comment on Buscaino's motion, Joey Bucket's motion from yesterday with the other two, you know, two of the other biggest bootlickers on the, the commit on the council, Monica and Nuri, uh, to, uh, new protocols for, uh, protests in front of city hall. Joey Buckets, we know exactly what this is about. This is not about safety. This is about you cracking down on people who want to protest outside city hall. We've already seen, and I've already mentioned the LAPD does not evenly enforce protest laws. They, they let white supremacists attack people. And when it's Black Lives Matter or people in front of Garcetti's uh, house, they get beaten by LAPD. And now you want to give them more reason to beat people? Absolute garbage, Joey Buckets. Absolute garbage. John Lee resigned from Next the city speaker. council meeting. Caller with a phone number ending in 1148, please press star six. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. I'd like to speak on all available items and general public comment, please. Sure, so you have three minutes for items 18 through 21, followed by one minute for general public comment. Please begin. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, 18, 18 through 21. Yes. First, uh, another city council session. Apologize to Miss Autry Martinez. Finally, apologize. Uh, item number 18, um, uh, wearing mask guideline. Uh, you should put in this motion, put in this, uh, this item, that it should apply to the LA City Council as well. Um, I don't see uh, Dawson's face up on the screen right now. I'm going to open up uh, videos to the public where Marquise Dawson is right in the middle on December 13th of some elderly 80-year-old women with no mask. He even apologizes for not coming, for not having a mask, but he comes out anyway. On December 15th, he assaults me personally with no mask for 15 minutes. I'm requesting him to put on a mask and get away from me. He illegally uh, uh, tries to put a restraining order on me and the corrupt uh, uh, LA uh, city attorney who's been absent in all of this LA city council corruption, Boisar, Lee, Price, Englander, Wesson's chief of staff, the mayor's chief of staff, Hoizar, sexual harassment. Where has the where has Mike Fuhrer been? He wants to be mayor. What a joke. So anyway, on mask wearing, the first person you need to contact is Marquise Harris Dawson, assaulter of the public. The rules should be applied to everybody. 
city council. That's what you people don't understand. Under Wesson, which is perpetuated by Martinez, it's you people against the city council against us, the public. Well, that has to stop. Mask wearing, absolutely. For the LAPD, for Mike Fuhrer, or Marquise Dawson, endangering people in the middle of a pandemic, which still may bring down this entire country. The vote trading has to stop. We need a new system, Martinez. Insanity, keep doing the same thing the same way. You people are just making money on the homeless. When you draft this ordinance, make sure it's equal to everybody and make sure it includes the Los Angeles Sleazy Council. So if you can go into general public comment if you wish, Ms. Moses. Thank you, sir. But uh, don't call me by any name unless I say my name, please. Just call me public or whatever, or caller like you usually do. Um, another session of the Los Angeles City Council making money on the homeless. We need to stop the vote trading. We need to get real solutions besides making money on them. Please, people are dying out there. We need to stop the vote trading. Marquise Dawson has received over $2 million from this Los Angeles City Council in, over, in the last 20 months, 18 to 20 months, for luxury offices, he has a Tesla paid for by the city in his driveway while people are dying on the city, on the streets. Yeah, Dawson, we know that you, that's a city vehicle which disappeared once we start picketing your house. Yeah, we Thank know. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. Caller with a phone number ending in 4208. Please press star six. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Hi, uh, this is Rob Kwan. I'd like to speak on 18, 19, 20, and general public comment. So you have three minutes, followed by one minute for general. Please begin. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm wondering why are we approaching the year anniversary of this pandemic reaching LA and only now are you requiring employees to wear masks? Um, you've had this uh, honor policy with LAPD uh, where they have no honor and they've been unmasked and now we're seeing repercussions of that. There are 900 LAPD officers currently in isolation. 2,200 have been infected over this whole period. Um, you know, I, I think LAPD and Council President Martinez should be forced to the back of the line for vaccines. Um, it only took an extra 4,000 deaths in LA County over the last month for Nuri Martinez to finally wear a mask in chambers, uh, all while putting forward this motion on the agenda, uh, requiring city employees on city property indoors to wear masks. It's all kind of ironic. Um, I, I worry, again, that, you know, we have these amending motions and documents aren't available for the vote. Um, it's 2021. Why can't our city clerk post these online or, you know, fucking shit, just tweet it out. That would be something. Um, for items 19 and 20, uh, I wonder why these were waived out of committee. Uh, why is it going to get approved without comment from our members? Uh, for item 20, it's probably because we're dealing with the DWP billing scandal. Um, something Mike Fuhrer said coming in that he was going to use to bring tens of millions of dollars to us. Uh, and now it's cost us tens of millions of dollars. Uh, the city was fined recently by a judge for serious abuse in this case. We've seen the FBI rolling through DWP and the city attorney's office. Um, you know, dealing with these matters, any of these matters, it's all complicated by the fact that we have an outdated municipal lobbying ordinance that leaves a complete <laughs> obfuscation of who is and isn't a lobbyist in City Hall, who is and isn't influencing land decisions, uh, matters like these. And Council President Martinez allowed that expire last year. Uh, her predecessor allowed it to repeat it expire. Um, this is something the council needs to actually pick up. Everything else you're doing is picking around the edges. Um, I want to turn to general public comment. I was really captivated by something in the goodbyes to Herb Wesson last month. Um, a council member said, you treat the members like a partner, not a problem. 
one city, not 15 fiefdoms, unquote. Uh, we've devolved into something else in this year. Uh, 15, we, we, even worse than 15 fiefdoms, we have one fiefdom here on this council, which would be best described as CD6 Enterprise. Uh, council Member Martinez, your colleagues may be willing to be obediently bend the knee to you, but they all know deep down that you are in over your head. Uh, John Lee, we've seen uh, trying to stop neighborhood councils from taking a position on its corruption. And what did Mary Martinez do? Appointed him to the committee overseeing neighborhood councils. John Lee, still on the Plum Committee. Um, John Lee, this summer, last time he talked about this publicly, said he's not allowed to speak on the corruption investigation. That could mean one of two things only. Equally possible, both of them. He's either lying and he's full of shit, very possible, or he's already flipped and is informing on his current colleagues. Um, I would just love nothing more than to see you step up like councils of the past and actually investigate corruption happening before you. But you're not. You're all going to just put your blinders on. I'll let somebody else get in here. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you, Speaker. Thanks, Rob. Next speaker. Call in user two, please press star six. Please state your name and the item you'd like to speak on. Hi, this is Stacey Dawson Stearns, and I would like to speak on 19 20 21 and general public comment, please. So you have three minutes for all the items and one minute for general public comment. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. So I just want to echo uh, Richie Sajanko's uh, thoughts about uh, this item 19. Um, you know, it, when you, Sunstream's for LLC doesn't even come up in LLC searches, it's completely opaque. And so opaque LLCs have contributed to development-related corruption in City Hall. And um, if you don't know how, you can just ask um, Council Member Lee to elaborate on that for us while he still has a voice in this chamber. Um, anyway, it, it's waving things through committee removes the public from participation in processes that affect our lives. And so all of these items, 19, 20, 21, they need to go to committee. We need to have an opportunity to hear our council members actually discuss these things. We need to hear stakeholders weighing in and we need to have a voice, period. General public comment, thank you, Mike Bonin, for stepping into 2021 with courage and using your voice to stand up to the LAPPL, the Los Angeles Police Protective League. Okay, I know that some of your colleagues can't do that because they're funded by them. But keep shining that bright light, and maybe some of the LA Times reporters who are listening right now who continue to parrot the LAPD's whining and lying about the $150 million cut will shape up. Do your homework, Vanister. It is a cut to a proposed increase. Okay, let's get it straight. I'm going to move on to talking about the police commission. Um, those meetings are scheduled on Tuesday, so I couldn't participate in, in the city council meeting yesterday because I was there watchdogging them as they screwed us over again. The, the, law, the, the police commission is a bullshit commission. It needs oversight. I don't understand why um, President Martinez dissolved the ad hoc police reform committee. That doesn't make any sense at all. We have like the biggest corruption situation happening. We're being held hostage by the LAPD and no one's doing a damn thing about it. Um, they, it, it's, it's absurd, it's obscene, and it's absolutely fucking crazy. Okay, now lastly, I'm looking at all of you right now. Thank you for this new setup. And Thank I you. see Next. a, I see half, excuse me. Next speaker. Caller with the phone number ending in 1248, please press star six. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller with the phone number ending in 3100, zero, zero. please press star six. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi there, uh, my name is maybe a girl, pronouns she, her, and I'd like to speak on items number 18 and 21. Sure. In general have, public comment. Sure, so you have two minutes for the items followed by one minute for general public comment. Please begin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm a member of the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council. I serve as the treasurer, and I'm also a homelessness, homelessness liaison for the city, but I'm speaking as an individual today. And on the topic of uh, mask enforcement, I just wanted to comment how appalled and disgusted I was that the um, Sean Fioit, uh concerts were allowed to take place here in L.A. on December 30th and December 31st. These were massive super spreader events that were targeting 
our unhoused communities. And there was notice about these events and they were still allowed to continue to happen. And they put our most vulnerable Angelinos in danger. I was particularly disgusted that there were no city officials, nobody trying to um, enforce people to wear masks. There was no sh social distancing. And the fact that it requires concerned citizens and volunteers from organizations like Streetwatch LA to block these people from encountering our unhoused neighbors uh, without masks, I think it's just absolutely awful. Um, it really speaks to where the priorities are in terms of protecting um, protests and free speech and and who you actually are concerned about. You know, if you take a look at the Block Our City protests, which happened, you know, around the same time, you know, LAPD bombarded protesters that were peaceful. LAPD was nowhere to be seen at Echo Park. Actually, that's a lie. They were there um, because the body was being removed from the lake at the same time. Anyways, um, I just think that it's absolutely disgusting that the city would allow that to happen and just sort of push it under the carpet like nothing happened. Um, we're watching and we're really, really upset. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Caller with the phone number ending in 7511, please press star six. Please state your name and the um, items you'd I'm like to e speak on. I'm Adrian, Oman I'm Adrian Omansky and I'm speaking on 18. You have a minute, please begin. Thank you, council members Bonin and Kortz for putting forth this motion for more mass enforcement. Absent this enforcement, the mandate is valueless. We see the repeated abuse by people who disregard the mask mandate, putting at risk not only our essential workers, but every one of us in the community who deserve at least a modicum of safety when we're out in the public. The failure to enforce the mandate has let, led to rampant abuse and puts each of us at risk. Many of my senior friends and neighbors with compromised immune systems, including myself, are unable to go to parks or take simple walks in the community. The senior centers have been closed. Where can our seniors go to get exercise, breathe fresh air, and feel safe? Where can any of us go to feel safe? I, along with thousands of seniors and their families, support this motion. Today, I got a call from another senior family, another senior Thank family. Thank you, Speaker. Caller with a phone number ending in 1676, please press star six. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Yes, my name's Kevin. I'm with the Sunrise Movement. Um, I'd like to speak on all available items and general comments, please. So you have three minutes for items 18 through 21, followed by one minute for general public comment. Please begin. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, on item 18 regarding, uh, excuse me, item 19 regarding masks, whatever the mask one is, um, it's clear that, you know, certain people like to go into Target and cause a storm, go to the malls, not wear a mask, do stupid white supremacist stuff. Um, and LAPD will just stand by and take photos with them or not appear at all. Uh, where, meanwhile, if there's like a Black Lives Matter protest anywhere, they'll come out guns blazing, riot gear and all that. So I really want to caution uh, what kind of enforcement would be, what kind of enforcement mechanism would be used for, for uh, any mask related item. <clears throat> uh, uh, for the following item, uh, 19 related to the uh, DWP contract, um, it, it is curious that this has not been in committee, uh, especially with uh, such a corrupt, sleazy person on this council like John Lee. Um, and then I would like to go to my general comments. Um, I want to thank Mike Bonin for his support of uh, Sunrise efforts to stop the gas plant at Intermountain Power Plant in Utah. Um, his support and reading the letter to the Board of Commissioners is really useful. Um, I'd also like to thank him for going hard at the LAPPL. Uh, you know, you all can do the same. LAPPL is a, an, an enemy of the 
people of LA. They are uh, obstructing the budget. They're, you know, they have their hands in all your pockets. Um, and so I, I want to commend Bonin for speaking out against them. I hope more of you do the same. Uh, Mitch O'Farrell, you commented on the uh, white supremacist riding at the Capitol last week, but I didn't see any outrage uh, about what happened on City Hall on that same day where several uh, black and brown people were beaten up by these you know, Nazis outside of City Hall. Um, you all need to stop commenting on national events when the same things are happening here in L.A. and you stay silent about them. This Thank goes you, for Speaker. Could that conclude some public comment for today's meeting? Let's go ahead and vote on 19 through 21, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Blumenfield? Uh, Blumenfield, aye. Bonin? Bonin, aye. Buscaino? Sadio? Sadio, aye. De Leon? Aye. Harris Dawson? Yes. Coretz? Aye. Krikorian? Krikorian? Lee? Aye. Martinez? Aye. O'Farrell? Aye. Price? Aye. Raman? Aye. Ridley Thomas? Aye. Rodriguez? Aye. Gregorian, aye. Thank you. So 14 ayes, these items are adopted. Madam Speaker? Who's speaking? Uh, Bob Blumenfield. For some reason, I'm, I'm having some technical difficulties. I can't seem to raise my virtual hand. And I also wanted to note for the record, was having trouble getting on this morning. I was here in the meeting, but couldn't get into the meeting. OK. Uh, so I, just, I, I was here to, um, I was also supposed to second item 18, which I wanted to verify that I was seconding it. But there's some sort of technical problem going on where I wasn't admitted to the meeting uh, up until just all right thank you right for making that. us aware of that if you can have a ita doesn't seem to think there's an issue anymore so they're nodding okay. their head um I, I definitely cannot see your virtual hand so maybe there is an issue there and we'll add you to a second um on to mr Coretta's amending motion on item 18. Right. let's thank move you. on to um item uh, let's move on to item 18 at this time so let's go ahead and start with Mr. Bonin, since you made the initial amended motion. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and thank you, colleagues. Um, uh, I put my amendment in today um, because uh, the, the, the report before us in the committee uh, is, is a bit dated and was uh, really the focus of dynamics that were taking place uh, in the city of Los Angeles with masks. They're very different than what we're experiencing now. Uh, and while there is a, a motion before us that we call for all city departments to uh, start doing enforcement, uh, I'm incredibly wary of that approach because I believe, uh, one, I don't know that we have the resources to do it, and two, I believe it creates a, 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 a basis for a, a whole new phenomenon of pretextual stops uh, that is just sort of uh, open for, for, for all sorts of abuses. But there are things that we are seeing in recent weeks which are incredibly disturbing uh, and incredibly harmful that I think we do have the ability to act on, which is why I crafted a more, a more narrow and actually stricter and more punitive measure. Uh, the things I'm talking about are like the incidents that we saw a couple of weeks ago at the, the, the mall uh, in Century City uh, or the, the, the concert that was uh, uh, in, in Skid Row. Uh, at the mall in Century City, crowds of massive people came in uh, and they confronted people. Uh, they confronted employees. They confronted customers. They were asked to put on masks and they refused to. Uh, we have other situations where people, these maskless protesters are going up to people, getting into people's faces uh, and deliberately using the fact that they are not wearing a mask as an act of aggression against them. Uh, and uh, these are actually very different circumstances. I'm not particularly interested in seeing um, 
uh, the, the city issuing citations for somebody walking from the parking lot of a Ralph's to Ralph's without the mask on. But when they get inside that supermarket and the manager says, I'm sorry, you can't come in here unless you wear a mask, and they refuse to either wear the mask or leave the store, then that needs to be subject to, to, to a fine and a penalty. Uh, and if they are going into a store, actually putting our essential workers at risk, confronting them, getting in their face without a mask and refusing to comply with those orders, that should be something that, that is subject to uh, a penalty. Uh, my, my motion is certainly not precise in its language. I was hoping the city attorney in crafting the ordinance uh, could fine tune it a bit. But I think what we need to be looking at rather than the, 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 a broad brush, which uses sort of the, the, the ACE, ACE violation system, is have something that is truly punitive for, for acts that are really aggressively criminal that are potentially causing harm to others. And so that's the point of, 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 of my amending motion today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonin. Mr. Carruds, would you wish to speak? You're the original maker of the motion. Yes, I'd like to speak uh, to my motion and to the amendments and uh, uh, perhaps to Mr. Bonin's amendment as well. Um, colleagues, in the last month, Los Angeles County has seen the number of COVID-19 cases increase by more than 400,000, a number it took 10 months to reach starting in March of last year. This week, countywide, the number of cases has, has well surpassed 900,000 since the beginning of the pandemic. And one in five Angelinos are testing positive for the coronavirus. And in recent weeks, the average number of deaths has surpassed 200 people daily. Um, I think the high was 318 in one day. And one person is dying every eight minutes. This surge is so bad that the County Department of Public Health recently revised their mask guidance, recommending that households with individuals who work or are public facing should also wear masks in their home to protect themselves from other family members. Back in July, a number of other jurisdictions, including West Hollywood and Beverly Hills, which are my immediate neighbors, um, stepped up to try and reduce COVID-19 transmissions by enforcing their mask mandates. The West Hollywood Sheriff's Station began by making conduct with those not wearing face coverings and providing them with face coverings without issuing citations. After a few weeks, they began citing people for not wearing face coverings and providing people face coverings at the same time. They focused on areas with a high number of pedestrians, which I would suggest, and reported they received tremendous positive feedback for their operations. The city of Beverly Hills also began with outreach education and distribution of face coverings. They deployed an interdepartmental task force and enforcement team consisting of code enforcement, public works, environmental inspectors, inspectors park rangers, the police department, building and safety inspectors, and hospitality ambassadors. The coordinated approach has allowed for over 30,000 contacts with people who had face coverings in their possession, but would not have put them on if not told to do so by city staff. So since Beverly Hills has approximately that same population, that would be the equivalent of 4 million contacts in Los Angeles, which I'm not suggesting but I certainly would suggest that we could match Beverly Hills with 30,000 contacts and with publicity, get the word out that we are enforcing and presumably reduce the number of uh, individuals who uh, continue to not use the mask, not social distance and to gather in large numbers. This report might've gotten us to where we need to be today if we had taken it up earlier but Southern California and Los Angeles are now the epicenters of the virus nationally and entirely out of control. And it's my understanding that LAPD and uh, uh, building and safety um, and street services 
have been very modestly enforcing the mask mandate included in the mayor's March 19th safer at home executive order. But given our current situation, we need to tackle this issue with renewed vigilance. This is why today I'll also be introducing a motion as an example, asking DOT to report back on efforts to reduce COVID infections on DASH buses and enforcement tools that can be used to achieve compliance. In an article in the, in the New York Times today, uh, a couple of lines, which I'll quote, the bottom line, Biden will be taking office next week during the nadir of the coronavirus crisis. His administration will need to both accelerate vaccine distribution and persuade more people to change their behavior. And the second goal is even more urgent than the first. Unless Americans start wearing masks more often and spend less time together in cramped spaces, many more people are going to die. So, so much more needs to be done. We need to enforce also our own employees wearing masks. Um, we are getting better, but we're not entirely there. Uh, I still get pictures sent to me from, uh, of groups of employees from different departments um, that are not social distanced and not wearing masks. So we need to, we need to do our own enforcement. We need to enforce where large crowds gather and where large numbers of people walk, um, wherever people are gathering in groups, wherever they're intentionally having uh, super spreader events. And uh, I certainly support Mr. Bonin's uh, motion um, in his amendment. I think those events that are designed to spread COVID certainly need to be among our, our absolute top, top priority and we need to enforce against those aggressively. Um, but it's not just the incredibly few events uh, where people are trying to spread COVID, it is the fact that in their daily lives, they are spreading it anyway. And once we're, now that we're at a point where one in five Angelinos are infected and spreading, and now that we're having new cases which are approximating 20,000 a day. And those are obviously just the ones that are being tested. We know those numbers are much higher. We have to take greater action. Um, and so I, my motion of course is very outdated after months of sitting, um, but uh, we absolutely have to be able to cite some people we're clearly not going to cite everyone. We're clearly not going to operate this on a complaint basis, but rather where in the course of their duties, uh, various departments that have a citation ability uh, can do that, um, particularly where there are large groups of people or large numbers of pedestrians. Um, I think we need to do all of this. Uh, we have had every excuse for not taking action. Uh, we still could find excuses for not taking action, but when we're having 300 deaths in a day um, and an average of over 200 and tens of thousands of cases in a day, we have to stop making excuses and start acting. And I would ask for an I vote on this item and the two amendments. Okay, no other speakers on this item? Okay, Madam Clerk, let's go ahead and prepare to vote on this item as amended. Thank you, Blue Madam Clerk, Hold on for just a amendments? second. Can we take the amendments up separately? Yes, 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 hold on for just a second. Okay. So I'm gonna ask the city clerk to go ahead and read the, each of the amendments. And then we're gonna vote on each of the amendments separately. So why don't you go ahead and start with the first one, Madam Clerk. The first amendment was introduced by Council Member Bonin and seconded by Council Member Koretz, and that is to request the city attorney to draft an ordinance that would provide fines and penalties for refusal to wear a mask at an indoor public place when requested to do so by management or operators of a facility or establishment 
operation or their agents and provide fines and penalties for refusing to wear a mask while invading someone's personal space. The second amendment was introduced by council member Koretz to be seconded by council member O'Farrell and council member Blumenfeld. And that is to, excuse me. That is to instruct the, all departments with administrative citation enforcement program authority to prioritize the issuance of citations during the normal course of business to persons not wearing a mask in public and report in 30 days with the status update on the issuance of citations, including number of citations issued, rates of compliance, and any ongoing challenges. Yes, two. Okay, there's two amendments. So we're gonna go ahead and vote on the first amendment, which was introduced by Mr. Bonin and seconded by Mr. Correct. So let's go ahead and call the roll. Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Bonin. Bonin, aye. Buscaino. Cedillo. Cedillo, aye. De Leon. Aye. Harris Dawson. Yes. Coretz. Aye. Krikorian. Aye. Lee. Aye. Martinez. Aye. O'Farrell. Aye. Price. Price. Aye. Raman. Aye. Ridley Thomas. Aye. Rodriguez. Aye. 14 ayes. This amendment passes. Okay, let's move on to the second amendment. This was introduced by Mr. Koretz, seconded by Mr. O'Farrell and Mr. Blumenfield. Blumenfield. Aye. Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Bonin. Bonin, no. Buscaino, absent. Cedillo. Cedillo, aye. De Leon. Aye. Harris Dawson. Yes. Coretz. Aye. Krikorian. Aye. Lee. No. Martinez. Aye. O'Farrell. Aye. Price. Aye. Raman. No. Ridley Thomas. Aye. Rodriguez. Aye. 11 ayes, three noes. This amendment passes. The item as amended. Let's go ahead and vote on, on the item as amended now. Blumenfield. So Blumenfield I, aye. So both amendments are now? Yes, the item passions. will be amended by both amendments. Bonin. On and I. Buscaino, absent. Cedillo. Aye. De Leon. De, De Leon. Aye. Harris Dawson. Yes. Coretz. Aye. Krikorian. Aye. Lee. Aye. Martinez. Aye. O'Farrell. Aye. Price. Aye. Raman. Aye. Ridley Thomas. Aye. Rodriguez. Aye. 14 ayes. This item is adopted as amended. Thank you, members. All right, thank you. Um, let's go ahead, Ms. Madam Clerk, what's next? The clerk has 21 verbal motions to read into the record today. 21? Yes. To go ahead and start with the first one. The first Rule 16 motion has been introduced by Council Member De Leon, seconded by Council Member O'Farrell. This amends Council Action of March 16, 2020, relative to the allocation of Council District 14 
AB 1290 funds for sidewalk improvements and community engagement. The next Rule 16 motion presented by Council Member Cedillo, seconded by Council Member Rodriguez, offers a reward for information regarding the murder of Maria Rodas Lemos and her grandson. The next motion introduced by Council Member Rodriguez, seconded by Council Member De Leon, referred to ad hoc COVID committee, instructs the Housing and Community Investment Department to report on current and proposed home ownership preservation programs that offer debt relief, debt forgiveness, and debt restructuring of mortgages. The next motion referred to the Personnel and Animal Welfare Committee, presented by Council Member Rodriguez, seconded by Council Member Harris Dawson, directs the Personnel Department to conduct investigations into any employee's involvement in the recent insurrection at the Capitol and report on the plan to investigate any findings and disciplinary actions. The next resolution to be referred to the Rules, Elections, Intergovernmental Relations Committee, presented by Council Member Bonin, seconded by Council Member Krikorian, supports sponsorship of legislation that would provide funds to state and local agencies to provide fair free transit. The next resolution to be referred to the Rules, Elections, and Intergovernmental Relations Committee, presented by Council Member Bonin and seconded by Council Member Harris Dawson, provides support for the House Resolution 25, which directs the House Committee on Ethics to investigate and issue a report on whether actions taken by members of the 117th Congress violated their oaths of office or the rules of the House of Representatives. The next motion to be referred to Public Safety Committee, presented by Council Member Blumenfield, seconded by Council Member Cedillo, instructs the Los Angeles Police Department to report on the investigation into the attack on a black woman by pro-Trump protesters gathered outside of City Hall on January 6, 2021, and to investigate whether the crime will be considered a hate crime. The next motion to be referred to the Public Works Committee presented by Council Member De Leon, seconded by Council Member Rodriguez, is relative to the naming of the Rose Ochi Square and directing the Department of Transportation to install and ceremonial signs. The next resolution to be referred to the Transportation Committee, presented by Council Member Rodriguez, seconded by Council Member Cedillo, resolves that excess, that vehicles in excess size to restrict the parking of those along Marnice Avenue and Woodward Avenue. The next resolution to be referred to the Transportation Committee prohibits parking of vehicles along Plummer Street in Sepulveda Boulevard and Plummer Street, presented by Council Member Rodriguez and seconded by Council Member Cedillo. The next resolution to be referred to the Rules, Elections, Intergovernmental Relations Committee presented, excuse me, those are the last that I have. We'll continue. Yes, the next motion was introduced by Council Member Coretz and seconded by Council Member Bonin to be referred to the Transportation Committee to instruct the Department of Transportation with the assistance of the Chief Legislative Analyst and City Administrative Officer to report on the city's public transportation network for daily activity and its impact by COVID-19. Next motion was introduced by Council Member Coretz and Council Member Krikorian to be seconded by Council Member Bonin and to be referred to the Energy, Climate Change, Environmental Justice and River Committee. It is to request the city attorney in consultation with the Small Business Commission to draft a foodware accessories upon request ordinance that would require restaurants and other food services providers to provide all disposable foodware accessories only upon request. The next motion was introduced by Council Member De Leon, Council Member Bonin, Council Member O'Farrell, Council Member Rodriguez, and seconded by Council Member Price to be referred to the Homelessness and Poverty Committee. And it is that council adopt the creation of at least 25,000 new units affordable housing units by 2025, regardless of the type of unit as the city's homeless housing goal. The next motion would be referred to the Homelessness and Poverty Committee. 
has been introduced by Council Member Blumenfield and seconded by Council Member Ridley Thomas. It is to instruct the City Administrative Officer, Chief Legislative Analyst, Housing and Community Investment Department, and, the re and request that the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority identify options for a reliable funding source for the Homeless Housing and Recovery Program. The next motion to be referred to the Planning and Land Use Management Committee was introduced by Councilmember De Leon and Councilmember Blumenfield and is seconded by Councilmember Price. And it is to instruct the Bureau of Engin Engineering in coordination with the Department of Building and Safety, Housing and Community Investment Department, and the Depar Department of City Planning to develop a limited set of standard plans for modular, multifamily homeless and affordable housing, bungalow courts, and accessory dwelling units. The next motion to be referred to the Planning and Land Use Management Committee has been introduced by Councilmember De Leon, Councilmember Price, Councilmember Rodriguez, and seconded by Councilmember Blumenfield. And it is, it is to instruct the Department of Building and Safety in coordination with the Department of City Planning, Housing and Community Investment Department, Public Works, Department of Transportation, Department of Water and Power, and Fire Department to develop an expedited permitting process for projects that build the most amount of permanent supportive housing. The next motion to be referred to the Housing Committee was introduced by Councilmember De Leon and Councilmember Bonin and seconded by Councilmember Price and it is to instruct the Housing and Community Investment Department to report on the creation of a renter's relief registry. The next motion is to be referred to the Homelessness and Poverty Committee and the Information Technology and General Services Committee. It has been introduced by Councilmember De Leon and seconded by Councilmember Rahman, and it is to instruct the Chief Legislative Anal Analyst in coordination with the City Administrative Officer, Department of General Services, Recreation and Parks, Water and Power, and all other city, de city departments who own land to report on the underutilization of all city-owned properties and the feasibility of using them for temporary or permanent homeless housing. The next motion will be referred to the Energy, Climate Change, Environmental Justice, and River Committee and also the Rules, Elections, and Intergovernmental Relations Committee. It has been introduced by Councilmember Krikorian and Councilmember Rahman, and it is seconded by Councilmember O'Farrell, and it is to instruct the City Administrative Officer with the assistance from the Office of Petroleum and Natural Gas Administration and Safety to report on potential amounts and structures of oil and gas extraction taxes for Los Angeles. The next resolution is a commendatory resolution to always remember Bernard H. Rollins for his inspirational passion for art and love and care for his community. This has been introduced by Councilmember Harris Dawson and seconded by Councilmember Bonin. The next commendatory resolution has been introduced by Councilmember Cedillo and Councilmember De Leon and seconded by Councilmember Martinez. And it is to declare January 28th as Dia del Profesor Juan Gomez Quinones, Day of Professor Juan Gomez Quinones, and honor a great historical figure and human being. And that is the end of our verbal motions. Council has motions for posting and referral. Motions will be posted on the clerk's website shortly after the meeting for the public's viewing. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And what's before us now? The desk is clear. Any announcements, members? I have Madam President. Two. Sorry, Madam President. Hold, who's speaking? I can't see you. I cannot see your virtual hand. Is this Mr. Krikori? And I apologize. Okay. I just wanted to ask that item 21 be sent forthwith, please. All, uh, all items have been sent forthwith, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we've got two announcements by um, Councilmember Lee and Mr. Willie Thomas. Mr. Lee? Thank you, Madam President. Colleagues, I just uh, tell everybody today is uh, the 118th anniversary of Korean American Day. This is a day we normally celebrate in council chambers, and we have done so for many years. Um, but unfortunately, we understand the situation we're in today, but I didn't want to let this day go by without um, talking a little bit about the history of Korean Americans, not only in this country, but in, in our city. Uh, this is a day when our nation celebrates the contributions of Americans of Korean descent in the United States. And the date, January 13th, is very significant because on January 13th, 1903, this is when the uh, first Korean immigrants arrived in the US by way of Hawaii to work on the pineapple and sugar plantations. 
And while you know, we often romanticize the experience of immigrants, uh, we tell our kids about how America is the land of opportunity, and it most certainly is. Uh, it certainly was for my family, but I believe we do ourselves and those who came before us a tremendous disservice by not telling the, the whole story and understanding uh, you know, these events in proper context. You know, Koreans recruited to meet um, a labor shortage because the country outright banned immigrants from China and then Japan. And soon after that, uh, the U.S. halted general immigration from Korea and other Asian countries. Uh, this was what was happening in our nation around the time the first Korean immigrants arrived. And sadly, we know too well that, you know, unfortunately, xenophobia and racism are still very much alive today. Uh, the Korean American experience was not smooth but beset with many obstacles. Um, Koreans faced racism and discriminatory laws, practices, and even threats of violence. Koreans weren't even allowed to naturalize and become citizens until 1952. But fortunately, that is not the end of our story. Uh, today, the voice of Korean community continues to grow. In fact, this past November, there were uh, several uh, Korean American candidates, not only in the city of Los Angeles and county of Los Angeles, but across the United States. And I hope that number will only increase in the years to come. You know, today, as we celebrate Korean American Day, I am proud to stand before you on behalf of people who have endured tremendous adversity and yet emerged with strength and determination. I am very proud of my Korean American heritage. I'm also very proud and honored to represent a community, uh, not only the community of CD12, but also a community that represents, that has over 20,000 Korean residents. I am very grateful to all the Korean immigrants uh, that came to this country and endured hardship and challenges uh, to the status quo, uh, especially to two of them, my parents, uh, who you know made sacrifices and took um, chances to come to this country in the late 1950s in order to pave a way for me to be uh, born in the greatest country uh, on this planet. So to all of you, I just want to wish you a happy Korean American Day. And I believe that my colleague, uh, Council Member Ridley Thomas has something to say. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Well, Mr. Ridley Thomas. Well, thank you very much, Madam President. And Council Member Lee, we thank you for your remarks. Um, consistent with the acknowledgement of American Day I'd like to lift up at least two uh, leaders in the Korean American community worthy of uh, acknowledgement. Um, I think we ought to recognize and commend the hard work of Dr. Laura Jung and James Ahn uh, of the Korean American Federation of Los Angeles. Uh, 2020 marks uh, the end of their term as president and uh, chairman respectively. Um, after years of dedicated advocacy and representation of the Korean American community. And they did so with a sense of inclusivity, uh, an ethic of diversity uh, that they brought to bear. I felt it was suiting that we take a moment uh, to recognize them for who they are and what they've done. Uh, Madam President and colleagues, a scroll has been prepared to document and acknowledge their contributions to the Korean American community and to the city of Los Angeles at large. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President, for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cedillo, do you have an announcement? Yes, Madam Chair. I just want to note that for us in CD1, uh, we take this matter very seriously. For us, it's Korean American Day every day. And I say that because the chief of staff of our office is Korean American. Yes. Debbie Kim is one of the first, one of the youngest, but one of the more prolific uh, leaders of our team and known uh, in our district and throughout the city as one of the most competent and efficient uh, public servants that exists. And so uh, I just wanted to make note of her leadership. Uh, I cannot be thankful enough for her mentorship from Tom LeBonge. I noted that yesterday. Uh, but I want to note today that uh, uh, it is Korean American Day every day in CD1 because of the leadership of Debbie Kim, uh, her commitment to servant leadership, and for all the great things that she does. 
she is an exemplary model of the integration uh, of the Korean American community into our city, uh, into our state and our great nation. So I just wanted to note that um, for the day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I just want to virtually rise in recognition of the contributions of the Korean American community in the city of Los Angeles uh, with Koreatown um, being uh, partially in, in the district that I represent, the 13th, along with Council Districts 4 and 10, um, and the just limitless contributions uh, to Los Angeles culture that the Korean American community has provided us and enriched us for all these years um, through, the, through the great uh, immigration uh, from the 60s and, and beyond, uh, and how uh, the Korean American community is, is now firmly a part of the rich fabric, which uh, is, is Los Angeles. Um, and I have professionally and personally benefited from this community as well. And I'm just really proud of my chief of staff, Jeannie Min, uh, and someone else on my team, Hannah Cho, uh, um, really great contributors to the 13th district. Uh, and we're all better off because of the city's diversity. Uh, and I'm just grateful and honored uh, to represent uh, Koreatown on the Los Angeles City Council. Uh, and uh, just wanna rise in with all of my colleagues and acknowledge how important it is, especially now more than ever, Represent Korea really stand up and represent and be proud of what makes America great is its diversity, uh, cultural diversity. Uh, and um, that is a message that we need to light from the beacon atop City Hall to shine across the United States and across the world with all that is going on. Um, Los Angeles uh, often does show the way for the rest of the country. And uh, I think we all need to be really proud of that, that uh, recognition and that designation and that responsibility that we have, quite frankly, especially considering the horrific uh, incident of sacking our nation's capital last week by uh, a, a white supremacist led uh, insurrection. Uh, so um, I, I We'll, we'll end there, uh, but uh, thank you, Mr. Lee, for uh, bringing this forward, and it is really a great day for Los Angeles. Thank you. Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, colleagues. I want to uh, thank Mr. Lee and for uh, bringing this forward, and it's a shame that we're not able to honor them in council chambers as we have uh, every year. And, uh, you know, I just also want to add to the comments and reflecting and uh, appreciation for the work of the Korean American Federation. Uh, they do an outstanding job in the preservation and uh, really the resiliency of the Korean community is found through its incredible collaborative spirit and uh, just grateful for their work and their presence in Los Angeles. Um, and also to acknowledge, I know Mr. Cedillo and Mr. O'Farrell have done it, but you know, when we look at the leadership of City Hall and we're looking at the three women chiefs of staff of Korean descent uh, that lead uh, the offices of some of our colleagues, uh, notably Mr. Lee, Mr. Cedillo, and Mr. O'Farrell, uh, it's an opportunity for us to celebrate the contributions of the, of the uh, matriarchs of the Korean community and the contributions that they that they provide in our city uh, and do such an outstanding job. So I just wanted to celebrate them as well and acknowledge them for their contributions, uh, as well as uh, 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 President Jung and her, and her work at the Korean American Federation. It's uh, it's really it's a uh, it's a privilege to uh, to have such diversity here in Los Angeles, and it's part of the wonderful fabric of of who we are as a city. And I just wanted to echo my, uh, my uh, appreciation and uh, happy Korean American Federa uh, uh, Korean uh, day. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kevin DeLeon. 
Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, uh, colleagues, I too also uh, join Ayong uh, Joseo to our good colleague, uh, Council Member uh, John Lee, uh, for uh, introducing uh, this uh, resolution in, con in recognition of our Korean American community. Because it's not just um, the gastronomical, uh, the cultural, uh, linguistic, as well as the musical contributions that Korean Americans have made uh, greatly uh, to uh, Los Angeles, to California, uh, to the entire nation, uh, but it's also the economic and political contributions. I've had the honor to represent uh, in the California State Legislature in both the Assembly as well as the Senate uh, as the Senator to represent all of geographically, all of Koreatown. And having the honor to actually go to Seoul, South Korea, and to Pohan, uh, and to see the, the soccer team, the Steelers, also to in Pohan, uh, uh, South Korea. And uh, um, I, I just, you know, uh, what our council member, uh, Gil Sadio, uh, just mentioned a few moments ago with, with Debbie Kim, uh, a chief of staff, and, and, and Hannah with, uh, with um, uh, council member uh, Mitchell Farrell, and I having uh, three uh, former uh, uh, staffers, uh, whether it be John Choi or my current staffers, uh, Brian Wang Bo, uh, both uh, Korean Americans, and and my political consultant, you know, a woman, a woman of color, uh, an Asian American woman, a woman who was born, you know, in South Korea uh, and came to America as an orphan, and has headed up some of the biggest political campaigns. Uh, in the state of California and was recently the political director to Kamala Harris as well uh, for the presidency of the United States that the Courtney Pugh, a woman, woman of color, an Asian woman, and a Korean American. So those are the amazing uh, contributions that the Korean American communities have made to who we are and it's the fabric of who we are as a great city. So uh, to my uh, good friend, uh, John uh, Lee, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity that you've given us today. Mr. Willie Thomas. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, President. I'd like to uh, call our attention to the fact that this weekend we celebrate the 92nd birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and uh, toward that end, um, I invite each of you to uh, join with us at the um, 29th Annual Empowerment Congress, um, which seeks to bring uh, contemporary expression to the message and the meaning of Dr. Martin Luther King. Our theme is reimagining civic engagement, fueling a movement for a better tomorrow. Um, everyone can register in addition to the personal um, invitations that I've extended uh, in writing. Uh, EC Summit 2021.org. That's EC Summit 2021.org. Uh, it's open to the public, and we certainly invite you to participate. Uh, delighted to have members of the council in various roles, President in the plenary, uh, uh, Council Member Raman, and one of the workshops, and more. Uh, this is an effort to um, acknowledge, celebrate Dr. King. Uh, might I say, Madam uh, President, <clears throat> uh, that Martin Luther King Jr. was 39 years of age when he was assassinated. And yet his words are replete with wisdom. And I certainly think those words are applicable uh, here and now the extent that um, it is acceptable, Madam President, hear ye him. When evil men burn and bomb, good men must build and bind. When evil men shout ugly words of hatred, good men must commit themselves to the glories of love. When evil would seek to perpetuate an unjust status quo, good must seek to bring into being a real order of justice. The words of Dr. Martin Luther King, I invite you to celebrate in the spirit in which he intended. 
Madam President. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're going to move on to adjourning motions. Mr. Koretz? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, Ms. Rodriguez, did you have an announcement before I move on to adjourning motions? Yep, adjourning. I can't hear you. Yeah, I'll okay. go after Mr. Koretz, I guess. Thank you. Mr. Koretz? Thank Can you, you Madam President. Um, I'd like to adjourn in memory of a dear friend of mine and uh, uh, many of yours, uh, Steve Afriad. Um, I first met Steve uh, 48 years ago during the McGovern campaign. Um, and I, I worked on his uh, campaigns for state assembly around 1980, uh, where he almost became the first openly gay assembly member uh, many decades before that uh, finally happened. Uh, uh, about 20 years ago. Um, he was a longtime member of the city family. He was an incredibly nice and affable guy, and he was a real match. And Steve first worked at City Hall as an advisor and chief of staff to former council member Xavier Oslovsky. And he hadn't worked at the city before, but he was very politically savvy and strategic. He was a quick study and quickly became someone that Zev depended on to navigate the complexities of city government. And he helped Zev become sort of the high priest of city budgeting during the 80s and 90s uh, before leaving to start his own consulting business, uh, Afriot Consulting. And in his uh, around 30 years as one of Southern California's most able consultants, Steve earned the respect and thanks of many as he helped them to grow their businesses with win community and governmental support for their development projects and fine tune public policy in ways that were broadly beneficial. He also kept his hand in the work of the city too, as serving on the, uh, the Animal Services Commission as its president at a cru crucial time in the city's animal welfare history. And under his leadership, the commission established animal friendly performance criteria for leadership of the department, which set the stage for what became a decades long evolution to national leadership in animal life saving and progressive policies um, and brought on a nationally renowned general manager to the department for the first time. Uh, working with animals this is probably something most people don't know about Steve but he approached his time on the commission with the same passion and compassion and professionalism that he brought to the rest of his career. Um, he worked uh, on many political campaigns over, over the past three decades um, and more, including uh, those in West Hollywood of John Duran, John D'Amico, uh, Abby Land and myself, um, as well as uh, now County Assessor Jeff Prang um, he worked on the campaigns of uh, Herb Wesson and Jan Perry, and I'm sure many, many others that uh, I'm not aware of. Um, he was a, a very dear friend of uh, many, particularly uh, Xavier Oslovsky and, and impacted his career. Uh, he helped start the first uh, AIDS walk um, in, uh, in Los Angeles in the 1980s. Uh, he was involved in the incorporation of the city of West Hollywood uh, and many, many notable projects in, in that city, uh, including uh, uh, entitling uh, a building of the uh, Pacific Design Center. Um, my heart goes out to his husband, Curtis, who he was with, as I recall, for around 30 years. Um, and to all of those who loved him, uh, I, I wish uh, Steve uh, blessings. And um, I remember his his great wisdom and his incredible menchiness. And uh, uh, he was someone who uh, I think to know him and to know him well was to love him. And uh, uh, may he rest in peace. He will be greatly missed by all those who knew him and interacted with him. 
Thank you, Mr. Koretz. Uh, Mr. Ofero has asked to speak um, on this adjournment as well. If there's other members who want to do the same, please let me know, Mr. Ofero. Oh, thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Mr. Koretz, uh, for your remarks on our friend Steve Afria. He was a beautiful person and a consummate professional, um, and he was able to be an anchor um, for really good things and for a really great progressive um, solution-oriented um, approach to problem solving as well in his own profession. Um, and he was exemplary in, in that sense with the work that he eventually went into. And, and that's how I know him. He could definitely take no for an answer um, because he was good to the core and his values, he really lived his values of being decent and respectful and having integrity. Uh, and even in choosing his own client list, he, he, he very carefully curated that as well, which in, when any of us interacted with he and his firm made it such a much more um, problem-free uh, working relationship uh, in all of the projects that he chose to work on and represent. And um, I just uh, really want to give my condolences to his husband, Curtis Sanchez, um, for the loss. And then uh, his, his, one of his managing partners, uh, uh, Aaron Green, and the entire family, because they were a family at that firm. And just lastly about Steve is that Steve was the chair of my LGBT um, working group. And um, over the years, he brought people together on my behalf and we worked together on promoting LGBTQ issues um, here on this council and out in the community. And so I feel like I've not only lost a really good friend, but someone who was part of moving uh, us forward in terms of the social changes uh, that we have embraced and are so important um, at, at the moment and, and in general. Uh, and so he'll be missed in that sense. We've lost a real champion of social change, a real champion for the LGBTQ community, and someone who could really bring people together to make good things happen. Um, and so uh, for that, he will be missed. Um, and that's also his legacy that we can all learn from. So thank you for allowing me to say a few words about my friend, our friend, Steve Afriot. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. Mr. De Leon. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. I want to also thank uh, Councilmember uh, Paul Koretz uh, for introducing this adjournment in memory. And as we all know, and has been mentioned, Steve was a, a, a pivotal, pivotal uh, advisor and influencer in such a fixture uh, in local politics for nearly four decades. Um, as mentioned, he served as the Chief of Staff uh, to then LA City Councilmember Zeb. Yaroslavsky back in the early 1980s. And it clearly was one of the most sought after political consultants easily back in the 1990s and 2000s, winning dozens of campaigns. But more importantly, you know, getting the approval of more than $2 billion worth of bond dollars for the city of LA for vital services such as fire stations, uh, libraries, and parks. And of course, as as Council Murmur uh, O'Farrell just mentioned, you know, in, in the city of West Hollywood, you know, he held a perfect winning record when it comes to candidates, when it came to candidates, when it came to ballot initiatives. But I think that as um, Council Member O'Farrell just mentioned a few moments ago uh, on social issues and causes, what, what gave Steve a, a great sense of pride was the role that he played as the co-founder of the very first LA Los Angeles AIDS walk back in 1985. And uh, that was a, a, such a turning point uh, in having the AIDS walk during the crisis of AIDS. And uh, he played such a huge vital role uh, for the region of Los Angeles. And obviously one of the, his moments of, of great pride during was his moments of, of service, whether it was being on count, the LA County Business uh, License and Civil Service Commissions, the City Animal you know, uh, Services, the Redistricting Commission, you know, the West, Hollywood Incorporation Committee, as well as the California State Dental Board and the Equality California Board 
of uh, directors. Um, as uh, mentioned a few moments ago, obviously he's survived by his partner of over three decades, 30 years, you know, Curtis, you know, Sanchez, uh, his sisters, Bonnie and Sari, and obviously his sister-in-law, uh, Debbie, uh, nieces and nephews, and his, his incredible partner also too at the Afria group and that being Aaron Green. So I also too would like to add my name in the German of memory of this great Angelina. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. De Leon. There's seven members on the queue, so can you indicate to me whether you want to speak on this adjourning motion? Mr. Blumenfield? Yeah, I have a, a couple of them, but I'll just speak to this one at the moment, which is, uh, I just wanted to add my voice. It's, it's Steve Afriot uh, is, is a friend. It's someone, he's someone I've known for decades. Um, I really got to know him. I mean, I knew him back when I worked for Howard Berman years ago, but I really got to know him when I, I came to the council. Uh, he was one of those folks who, who really, after I was elected, sat me down and told me a lot about how things, how things really work in, in City Hall, what to look out for and, and that kind of thing. And just, and throughout my time here has always been there as a, as a friend. Um, so I just, you know, all, all of the details have been shared and, and uh, my heart goes out to Curtis and, and, and the whole, I mean, I, I'm glad the Afriac group is gonna continue with Aaron and, and his work will continue, but uh, there'll be a big hole in all of our hearts uh, with, with Steve being gone. He was just, just a really decent person. I mean, I, you know, just a really good person uh, who was straightforward. Uh, that's the other thing about him is even, you know, when you dealt with him professionally, you always knew, even if you weren't gonna agree on something, he's gonna give you the straight scoop. Uh, so it is just a, it's with a heavy heart uh, that I join in this adjourn in memory um, and, you know, may he rest in peace. He certainly will be missed. Thank you, Mr. Bloomingfield. Anyone else members wishing to speak on Mr. Af Afriad's adjourning motion? Um, Madam President, with yes, your Mr. permission. Yes, Mr. Go ahead, sir. Um, I think um, I'll have to have an extensive conversation with um, Mr. Afriad the next time we see each other uh, because I was under the mistaken impression that I was his favorite public official. He always uh, made me feel that way. But after these testimonials, I've obviously been disabused of that notion. It speaks to who he was and his affirmation for all people, uh, his gifts uh, to be of help, to be of service, uh, and uh, to cause us to have a favorable view of him. I uh, shared the sentiments that have been expressed uh, and appreciate and feel better as a result of having known him. May he indeed rest in peace and may we choose to emulate the best of what he deposited in us. Madam President. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak on this adjourning motion? Madam President, just yes, for the Mr. record, Cedillo. let me, <clears throat> Council Member Cedillo, let me attach myself to all the eloquence that has been stated. Uh, he was truly that uh, special, uh, special man and a personal friend. And uh, I look forward to continuing to work with his, his company and to continue to help develop his legacy. Uh, thank you so much. Anyone else? Okay, Mr. Koretz, um, if I can also join you on this adjourning motion. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Bonin? I just wanted to be listed on the adjourning motion as well, Madam President. I don't need to add to the incredible and accurate comments that have already been made. Yeah, I would agree. Um, he was not only a, a great person, but also a really dear friend. So if I can, Mr. Koretz, I'd like to make this an all member adjourning motion. In the memory of Mr. Afret. Thank you. And may he rest in peace. Thank you for bringing this forward. Um, we're going to move on to the next adjourning motion. Ms. Rahman? Um, I had uh, three individuals I wanted to um, speak about today, but I'll keep it as brief as possible. Um, the first day of this new year brought another tragedy for the city of LA uh, the passing of Fire Captain George Roke. 
a 37 year veteran of the fire service with 22 years at LAFD who's, and he was serving in station 97 in Mulholland and Laurel Canyon. He was uh, only 57 and he was the second firefighter that Los Angeles has lost to COVID-19. Um, Captain Roque was a proud lifelong resident of Redlands. He built his own home there with his father. He was a craftsman, expert in many aspects of building, and he owned four and a half acres of orange groves that he tended himself. He was beloved in the communities that he served uh, in LA. Uh, from his station in Maholden Drive, um, he was incredibly attentive to neighborhood concerns, and he was a dear, dear me member of the Laurel Canyon community. And I just wanted to remember him today. And did you have Madam another? Madam President. Yes, uh, Mr. Kerr. Sorry, this is. Okay. And if I could just join uh, Ms. Rahman uh, in this adjournment, uh, the captain was um, also known not only as an extraordinary firefighter, but a person who was deeply caring about our constituents. And he was, um, he was known for going the extra mile after an incident um, to take care of people who had uh, suffered a loss because of fire or a, a medical emergency to check in on them afterwards and make sure that they were taken care of. And um, it's, um, it's a great loss for our communities, for the department, uh, for the men and women of 97s, um, and for our respective communities. And it's appropriate that we do this adjournment on the same day that we're talking about uh, the imperative of wearing masks, because almost 700 of our Los Angeles firefighters have been diagnosed as positive with COVID-19, almost 700. These are men and women who put their lives on the line every single day. Uh, and we have already lost two firefighters now uh, to this disease. So if you don't wear a mask, uh, don't wanna wear a mask because uh, you think that it's inconvenient, if you don't wanna wear a mask because uh, you think you want to make a statement about liberty, please know that you're putting in danger the lives of the men and women who wake up every day trying to protect your life. And it's wrong. Uh, and so I want to join Ms. Rahman in um, recognizing the, the passing, uh, this passing, and also um, uh, extend condolences to the men and women of 97s uh, and also to George's wife and, and children. Okay, thank you, Ms. Roman. Did you have an, a second adjourning motion? Yes, I had uh, two more. Sure, go um, ahead. And I wanted to uh, honor uh, a, a legend in the LA equestrian community who passed recently, a passionate steward of Griffith Park, uh, the former vice president of the Los Angeles Equine Advisory Committee, a woman named Lynn Brown. Um, who was a treasure in the CD4 area. Uh, and I just wanted to say that we are saying goodbye uh, to Lynn um, at the same time that we had to say goodbye to Tom LaBange. Uh, and they had a very strong relationship and the two of them shared an incredible passion for Griffith Park. And I think so many of us here in Los Angeles have really reaped the benefits of that collaboration. And so I just wanted to uh, honor her as well today. Um, and the final uh, person I wanted to honor through an adjourning motion, uh, in grief and in celebration, I'd like to remember uh, Jeffrey Pereira, who was a resident of the LA River. Um, he lived between Silver Lake and Atwater Village, and I got to know him through my time at the Sela Neighborhood Homeless Coalition. Um, he was a giant. He was, he was as big as a giant, and his personality was huge. But, uh, you know, what he exuded was love. Um, he was incredibly sweet. So much of his life was struggle, but you would really never know that when you when you were talking to him. Um, he brought so many people into care in our area, in this region of the city. When Sela started offering services at the Silver Lake Community Church in partnership with the pastor there, Pastor Kyle Jokim, it was actually Jeff who acted as an ambassador to bring people in, to bring people into those meals and to connect people with services. Uh, he passed away on December 18th. Um, in the river, surrounded by his friends, where he had been for many decades. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Roman. Uh, Mr. DeLeon? Mr. 
Mr. DeLeon, did you have an adjourning motion? Okay, Ms. Rodriguez? Thank you, Madam President. And uh, thank you, Ms. Rahman. Uh, George was also one of the adjourning motions that I wanted to honor. Um, tragically, we've had uh, three members, uh, three first responders that have lost their life as a result of COVID-19. And so in addition to uh, George and, and recognizing him for his tremendous service to our Los Angeles City Fire Department, I uh, want to honor the memories of two members of our, our Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to ask that we adjourn today in memory of Police Service Representative 3, Raymond Guerrero, assigned to LAPD's Communications Division, who passed away due to COVID-19 complications on January 7th. Raymond honorably served the City of Los Angeles for 24 years and dedicated his career to ensuring that every call for service made by the community members we serve was answered. Mr. Guerrero is survived by his wife, Deborah, also a police service representative three assigned to LAPD communications division and their two daughters. Our deepest condolences go out to Raymond Guerrero's entire family, colleagues and friends during this most difficult time. May he rest in peace. But also ask that we adjourn in memory of Sergeant Amelia Perry Martinez, who tragically passed away this morning due to COVID-19 complications. Sergeant Martinez joined the, part, the department on July 12, 1993, serving for 27 and a half years. She worked assignments in the South Traffic Division, Central Area Operations, Central Bureau, and Hollenbeck. On January 4th, 2009, she was promoted to sergeant and was assigned to uh, patrol field supervisor at Hollenbeck area station. In 2010, she transferred to central area as a field supervisor and returned to Hollenbeck in uh, 2012. She is survived by her sons, Robert and Stephen, her daughter, Amanda, and her mother and several siblings. Our deepest condolences to the families and friends of both our fire family and our police family. Uh, may their memory be a blessing and may they rest in peace. Thank you. Um, Mr. Blumenfield. Great, thank you. I wanna do an adjourn in memory and then uh, after Mr. Uh, Marquis Harris Dawson does one, I'm gonna add on to that. So uh, I'd like to ask that we adjourn in the memory of Joan Milky Flores. We suffered a, a terrible loss as the city last month with the passing of this former city councilwoman. Joan Milky Flores passed away peacefully on December 19th at the age of 84. She's one who began her career with the city as a clerk typist, and she quickly worked her way up at City Hall, becoming an influential councilwoman and representing the 15th council district leaving behind a tremendous legacy and, and setting the bar very high for all the electeds who followed her. And Joan, having been born in 1936 in Wisconsin, was one of six children. Her family moved to California when she was eight years old and she grew up in Highland Park. She desired something different um, than many of the young women around her time. She wanted a, a career, a fruitful career. And so after her graduation from high school, she started working for the city as a stenographer. She joined the office of city councilman John Gibson Jr. where she began working as his secretary, but would move up ultimately to chief deputy. Gibson's retirement prompted Flores to run for the seat. And she did, uh, and she won that seat and she served three terms from 1981 to 1993. She was the first woman to represent the dis uh, that district, District 15. She was a powerful presence in the council uh, and it was a council where the horseshoe was, uh, was mostly men. She always made sure to encourage women and to promote their rights and growth, even amongst her own city council staff, which was also mostly women. She was known for her loyalty to her district and her push to make city government more transparent. She was one of the people who pushed to televise our city council meetings, uh, and they started airing in 1989. She felt the broadcasts were important for citizens to learn about what their government is doing um, not just the reaction. She led 
the creation of the uh, Alameda Corridor Transportation Authority, which is a regional board that oversaw the new freight railway and, ser and she served as its chair. She also gave the corridor linking Los Angeles with its port a new name, Harbor Gateway, to give the community its own identity. She additionally authored a number of groundbreaking uh, legislative items, including curbing smoking in public locations. She even had a park named after her and so much more. The park, by the way, is a place that council member Buscaino asked me to say is one of the happiest places he's ever seen. He says it looks like heaven, beautiful rolling hills, amazing ocean views, and just full of happy dogs running and playing. And then he can't think of a better way to commemorate her life and legacy. Uh, in fact, he asked me to, to move forward with this, even though he was not here, uh, he wanted to make sure that we honored her. Um, after leaving City Hall, Flores formed a consulting firm. And when she retired, she spent her time traveling around the world and watching the Dodgers. She loved the Dodgers. She spent her final years in San Pedro. Flores is survived by Valerie Flores. And many of us here know Valerie from the city attorney's office. Valerie, we are so lucky to have you. You are a shining legacy of your mother for the amazing civic work that you do every day. And I know your mother is looking down on you and is very proud of, of the work that you do and you are continuing her legacy um, in the great work that you do. Joan Milky Flores is also survived by her sister, Ruth Rinker, her grandson, Trevor, and her longtime companion, Bernie Evans. Our hearts go out to her family, friends, and former colleagues, particularly those of us um, that are still amongst our city family. We're all here for you. We mourn with you, Valerie. We mourn with your family. Um, and really, this is, a, this is a loss for the entire city, a councilwoman uh, that gave so much. May she rest in peace. Thank you, Mr. Bloomfield. We can also ask that uh, we make this an all-member adjourning motion. Absolutely. And our hearts and uh, condolences go out to Valerie um, for her loss. Um, thank you, Mr. Bloomfield. Did you have another adjourning motion? I, I do, but I'm going to wait until um, Marquis does it. I'm going to add on to his. All right, thank you. Mr. Harris Dawson? Thank you so much, Madam Chair. It's uh, with a very heavy heart that I ask um, colleagues of the council to join me in adjourning in the memory of Bernard Bernie, Bernie Rollins, uh, a man of uh, many talent, talents, an artist, an activist, a journalist, and an all around uh, Angelino. Uh, Mr. Rollins, uh, who's known uh, to many of us uh, here on the council, was, uh, comes to us from New York City, where he was born in 1933. Uh, he moved to Los Angeles in 1959, uh, got work in the aerospace engineer, but always uh, nurtured and grew his talent and his guide star as an artist. Uh, he uh, had all the day jobs that you need to support a family and uh, continue to build, uh, to build his, his art career. Uh, he uh, gained a reputation in Southern California uh, to the point that he played a key role in designing one of our iconic night spots in this city, uh, the world famous Maverick Flats on Crenshaw Boulevard uh, was one of the first uh, projects that he helped design. Uh, that club uh, quickly became known as the Apollo of the West uh, and hosted a variety of acts uh, that are world famous uh, to this day. He uh, then later in life uh, took a job in uh, Vietnam in the ashes of the Vietnam War. Uh, he went uh, to the country to help rebuild it, to build bridges. Uh, to help build that city, to serve as an engineer and an architect uh, for important projects there. Uh, he start, met um, someone there and started a family uh, where they bore uh, one child. He returned to Los Angeles in 1968 and began working on a publication called Soul Illustrated, uh, where he eventually took over uh, and wrote uh, timely and evocative pieces like The Whites, Behind the Blacks and, the, and In the Search of Soul Philosophy, published interviews with the leading characters of that day like Huey Newton and Angela Davis, 
In the 70s, he wrote uh, and helped produce uh, some of the first uh, black television shows, one called Black Omnibus, starring James Earl Jones. Uh, they, uh, along with his partner, Mr. John da Daniels, they produced films, one of the best known uh, ones being Getting Over. Later in life, he served as the producer for the um, NAACP awards. Uh, and uh, I met uh, Mr. Rollins when he served as an art director and the lead cartoonist for the Wave newspapers uh, here in Los Angeles. And so uh, sometimes you would open it up and there would be a funny picture of uh, uh, the eighth district council person um, telling off Mayor Reardon about some important issue and that uh, the artist of those those uh, uh, cartoons was none other than Mr. Rollins. Uh, Mr. Rollins uh, uh, had a wonderful family uh, and included uh, one of the shining examples of the, the best of what it means to be an Angelino. Another uh, person who comes to us uh, by way of uh, Barbados and New York City, the one and only Frank Jamont of the Jamont Rollins Group. Uh, many of you know Bernard Dory. Uh, who worked in City Hall for some time and in the Sacramento uh, at other points in time. Uh, he is uh, their, uh, Fran and uh, Bernie's son. Um, he left a host of grandchildren, uh, uh, nieces and nephews, uh, children, to bear witness uh, to the gift that has been uh, Bernie Rollins. So some years ago, a beer company used to run a commercial uh, where the tagline was the most interesting man in the world. And uh, many times I got to sit and have breakfast with Mr. Rollins and the stories that he had uh, about uh, the things he had lived through, the experiences he'd been able to avail himself, the relationships he was able to build, and the history that he was able to bear witness to uh, made him, for me, one of the most interesting uh, men in the world. And so um, I ask that the council uh, uh, adjourn in his memory and uh, wish that he rest in power. Thank you, Mr. Harris Johnson. Mr. Blumenfield, did you want to speak to this adjourning motion? I do. Thank you. Um, and, and Marquise, thank you for, for so eloquently talking about Bernie. You did a great job of, of capturing him. He's an amazing, he was an amazing guy. And I had the privilege of getting to know him uh, really through through his wife and he um through my wife we we've been friends for a while they we go to their annual kwanzaa event every year uh when i think of the two of them together i think of three words uh, love community and justice that's what that power couple is all about um and bernie was not only you know i'm reminded of bernie every time i sit at this desk because right in front of me is a painting that he does. And I just took it down to show you here. If you, oh, I've got to, uh, I think I have to turn off my, my background for you to see it. Um, this painting here hangs above my, my desk and it's, it's, it's was a Bernie original. And when my wife was uh, running Liberty Hill, she had, they had a number of his paintings because Fran was so involved with the organization uh, and she had this one in her office and she loved it so much when she told Bernie about that he made a special copy of it for her which we have displayed prominently in our home office uh, and it's just that's the kind of guy he was I mean it just he, he had this very prolific painting as well which he didn't always spread with the world so we're probably one of the few people to have have a Bernie original here uh, but he was just as Marquise mentioned a master of, of so many trades and, and really just an interesting guy and a dedicated person. Uh, I'm privileged to have gotten to know him uh, and, and the power couple that is he and Fran. So I join you in adjourning in his memory uh, and may he rest in peace. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ridley Thomas. Oh, thank you, madam. President, I, um, may I proceed with the, uh, the two adjourning motions that I have, or Just were you asking me to pick up from Mr. Harris Dawson? 
If you wish to speak on um, Mr. Harris Dawson's adjourning motion, you can do that and then go into your two adjourning motions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, I think uh, Mr. Harris Dawson again distinguishes himself in terms of his encyclopedic uh, rendition of the life of one who has left us. He has uh, made plain uh, his impact and uh, the extent of his uh, influence. I simply want to uh, say that I acknowledge his passing and lift up his family, both Fran uh, and Bernard, and the extended family who loved and celebrated uh, this great one. Uh, additionally, uh, Madam uh, President, may I uh, simply take the opportunity to acknowledge uh, John Mulkey Flores, with whom I served um, on the city council. Uh, she was quite exceptional, as uh, was indicated. Uh, may she rest in peace, and may uh, we never forget um, the trailblazing impact that she had uh, on the Los Angeles City Council. May I turn your attention to uh, the passing of Theodore Ted Lumpkin, um, a member of the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, who died on December the 26th, just days shy of his 101st birthday. Mr. Lumpkin was drafted into the military in 1942 when he was a student at UCLA. He was assigned to the 100th Firefighter Squadron all black unit in Tuskegee, Alabama, where he served as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Air Force. Uh, he became an intelligence officer, briefing pilots about missions during his overseas tour um, in Italy. Uh, during his time in the military, he earned his bachelor's uh, and master's degree and ultimately retired from the Air Force Reserves as a Lieutenant Colonel. He went on uh, to work for the County of Los Angeles, um, serving as a social worker for over 32 years. He later became a real estate uh, broker and opened his own uh, company. Uh, he and his fellow uh, Tuskegee Airmen, Madam uh, President, received the Congressional gold medal in 2007. And nearly two years later, uh, President uh, Barack Obama invited Mr. Lumpkin and the other surviving uh, squadron members to uh, his inauguration. But I'd like to say that Mr. Lumpkin served as president of the Los Angeles chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen, and, uh, as well as uh, a national board member and a Western regional representative he was also a board member of the uh, Tuskegee Airmen Scholarship Foundation. Did a lot of work, a lot of good work, blessing um, uh, young people who uh, understand that education is the great great equalizer and they uh, were willing to pay it forward. And so Ted Lumpkin Jr. survived by his wife, two sons, one daughter, several grandchildren and one uh, great grandchild. He will be missed. A centenarian he is, and his memory will uh, forever be uh, cherished. May he rest in peace. Then, uh, Madam, Madam President, I'd like to add, add on to that uh, as well uh, to uh, Mr. Lufkin. Uh, he okay. was a real, uh, real pioneer, uh, always had a kind word, and uh, although he was retired, I think he was most active uh, still, not just in real estate, but in community affairs. So I'd be honored to join you, uh, Mr. Thomas, with that. Thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Price. <clears throat> Madam President, uh, with your permission, I'd like to also um, adjourn in memory uh, of Rose Matsui Ochi, uh, a trailblazing political and civil rights activist for criminal justice reform and Japanese American uh, causes. She died at the age of 81 on December the 13th after being diagnosed with a second bout of COVID-19. Uh, Rose was born on December the 15th, 1938 in East Los Angeles. She was 
just three years old when her family was forcefully uprooted from their home and imprisoned in an internment camp in Arkansas after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Although this experience occurred while she was a young child that fueled her lifelong effort to combat racial injustice. Uh, she would go on to help Japanese Americans uh, and then entire community with recognition and redress for the mass incarceration of some 120,000 uh, persons of Japanese descent, um, including a federal apology and monetary payments to internment camp survivors in 1988, uh, establishing the Manzanar camp in the Owens Valley as a National Historic Site in 1992. Her work did not stop there. Uh, Rose Ochi became the first Asian American woman to serve as a Los Angeles Police Commission member and as an Assistant U.S. Attorney General. She served on President Jimmy Carter's Select Commission on Immigration and Refugee Policy and worked with President Bill Clinton on drug policy and race relations. She made significant contributions, uh, Madam President and colleagues at City Hall as an advisor to both uh, mayors, uh, Tom Bradley and James Hahn. So Rose Ochi's life is a testament, I'd say, to the value of building bridges across communities, across cultures, across political lines. Uh, an example we must look to emulate, uh, particularly at this point in our city's history and journey. She is survived by her husband, Thomas Ochi. She's left an indelible mark in the lives of many people in the city of Los Angeles and well beyond. She'll ever remember, forever remember as someone who uh, was determined to do good, to make good and to lift people up. Uh, may we always remember the life and the work of Rose Matsui Ochi, Madam President. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gakorian? Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, members, I'd like to ask that we adjourn this meeting of the City Council in memory of Sandy Scully, the beloved wife of Dodger Hall of Fame announcer Vin Scully who passed away on January 3rd um, at the age of 76. Uh, Ms. Scully was born in Virginia and raised in North Carolina uh, and for almost a half century uh, was the loving wife and um, principal source of support and encouragement uh, for Vin Scully. Um, I remember the first time that I met her uh, and introduced myself and told her what I did for a living. The very first thing she said is, you people should name a street after my husband. And uh, she was quite forceful in advocating and uplifting Vin. We, we've all seen her by his side at all of the critical moments in his career during his retirement and uh, his entry into the Hall of Fame and, and so many other uh, important moments uh, in his life and career. And uh, thankfully, because of her advocacy and because of the leadership of uh, our colleague, Mr. Cedillo, uh, Vin Scully Way has now become a reality. So uh, what she pushed for so forcefully against Vin's will uh, turned out to actually uh, take place. So um, it's a tremendous loss, obviously, for uh, the Scully family and for for Vin, um, and I know we all want to extend our best wishes and condolences uh, to Vin Scully, uh, as well as to uh, Catherine, Kelly, Aaron, Todd, and Kevin, uh, and to Sandy's 21 grandchildren and six great-grandchildren. Uh, the family has asked that in lieu of flowers, uh, donations can be made to the UCLA Department of Neuromuscular Disease for ALS research. Um, may Sandy Scully rest in peace and may Vin Scully and their family take comfort in knowing that the entire city of Los Angeles grieves this loss along with them. 
Thank you, Mr. Gokur, and I also ask that this be an all-member uh, journey motion as well. Mr. Cedillo? Madam Chair, thank you so much. Let me add my voice, uh, and thank you, Mr. Kokorian, for bringing uh, this up. This this period of time, uh, I, I was just suggesting to someone that we should jump straight to 2022 because uh, the beginning of this year has just been uh, tragic for so many families, uh, both COVID-related uh, and then other natural losses of life. Um, but Sandy Scully was the, the love of life of Vince Scully. Boy, you could not be around them uh, and not feel that you were interrupting their time wherever they were. It could be at the stadium. It could be uh, at an awards meeting. Uh, he was just uh, tickled every time she was near him. And I just have such great uh, admiration for the, for the love they shared and the love that will continue, uh, no doubt, having live that experience. Uh, and what a, a beautiful and elegant woman. I mean, talk about a man who had pride for his bride. Uh, it was extraordinary. And then let me add uh, my voice uh, to follow uh, the eloquence of uh, Mark Ridley Thomas. Uh, but let me add to this, a very important point to Rose Ochi, also uh, a beautiful woman, elegant, stylish, but very important to her from Borough Heights. Very important to her, a rough rider. Very important to her, these experiences that were outlined of growing up uh, in the rich diversity of Borough Heights, the Alice Island of the West Coast, a community where people all came with their greatest hopes and aspirations, and then confronted incredible uh, racism uh, in our society. Uh, during times of tumult, there are lessons to be learned, uh, the lessons of her family, and her leadership uh, are part of the richness that comes from Borough Heights. And I mentioned this uh, to be redundant, but to acknowledge how in many instances, people were surprised that this beautiful woman was so tough, uh, so forceful, had such strength. And when asked why, she said, well, I'm from Borough Heights. And that was her answer. I'm from Borough Heights. And so, she uh, was a really special person. I, uh, I cannot tell you how we on the east side admired her. Uh, I did, I uh, was always flattered uh, to uh, talk to her and to receive her counsel and her advice. What a special, special uh, woman. What a great uh, Angelino. So I just wanna add uh, my voice uh, to this great chorus uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cedillo. Mr. De Leon. Thank you very much, Madam President. I also too want to add my voice to the eloquence of uh, our council members, Mark Willie Thomas and uh, council member Gil Cedillo uh, to underscore council member Gil Cedillo's um, words. Uh, she was from the East side, uh, from Boyle Heights, uh, born and raised. And uh, she went to Stevenson uh, Junior High School. <laughs> I just mentioned a few moments ago, Boyle Heights. Uh, but um, yeah, obviously, as we know, because of Executive Order 9066 by then President FDR, uh, uh, her family ended up in, in Arkansas uh, in a, a, a camp. And this happened to so many Japanese Americans. So this has uh, uh, had a, such a, a, a huge impact on her lives. And it made her who she was, a, a great civil rights leader for all individuals. And, and, and what had an impact on her is because the, the 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 amazing city that LA is with the, the great diversity, the amazing tapestry of so many different hues, uh, folks from all over the country, from all over the world, uh, is that it was actually the Chicano walkouts from East LA in Ball Heights that had the impact on this woman, Takayo, Takayo Rose Ochi. It had the impact on her to become a lawyer and to advocate for those who had little or no voice. And that's why, you know, when it's Japanese American, uh, Mexican American, Central American, whether it's African American, uh, Armenian American, you know, and so many different ethnicities, Korean American, that is the strength of who we are. And that's what helped form and forge 
this tough steel rows that Councilmember Gil Sardio uh, just uh, eloquently articulated. Uh, we will be naming a square uh, for Takayo Rose uh, Ochi uh, in Little Tokyo uh, in the immediate future. And I just wanted to add uh, my words uh, for a German in memory of this great Angelino, uh, this great Californian, this great American. Thank you. Mr. Koretz? Yes, uh, just about everything that could be said about Rose Ochi has been said, but I just wanted to add that uh, she also cared about the community colleges and in 1989 ran for the LA Community College Board. Uh, I supported that campaign um, and she lost by a hair, if I recall correctly, less than a percent. Um, but uh, I thought that should be acknowledged as well. She was involved in so many good things and uh, that one effort should not be forgotten as well. Thank you, Mr. Kurtz. Any other adjourning motions, members? I see none. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>